All right, if you could, turn your Bibles to the first chapter of Hebrews as we continue our series through the Hebrews. And we're going to be teaching verse, beginning with verse 5 today. In review of last week's sermon was an introduction to Hebrews, and then we did an exposition of verses 1 through 4. We saw the prologue, but more specifically, in verse 1, he spoke of the past. In verse 2, he spoke of the last days or the end times. And in verse 3, he spoke of Christ's radiance of the glory of God. And in verse 4, he spoke of Christ's superiority over the angels. And today, today in verses 5 through 14, will be 5 through 14, but more specifically, in verses 5 through 6 is Christology over angelology. Verses 7 through 9 will be is Christ perfectly loves and perfectly hates. Verse 10 through 12 is our Creator and Christ are eternal, but is creation not so. And verses 7, or excuse me, verses 13 through 14 will be God's angels are for his elect. Oh Lord, help me teach your word, Lord, as, as Christ said to your church, to the para, in the parable of the vine, to the branches, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, I can do nothing. And so I pray, Father, that you help me abide to your son Christ as a branch on the true vine of Israel, the vine of the church. I pray, Christ, that you would be exalted in these scriptures that speak so grandly of you, Christ. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will help me teach the congregation that we would all grow in your grace and knowledge of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Verses 5 through 6 is Christology over angelology. Let me read the text first. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Now, Paul recites two verses here from the Old Testament, uh, and they are Psalm 2-7 and 2 Samuel 7-14. In Psalm 2-7, God addresses Jesus as his son. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, this word begotten here refers to the Godhead and the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. One author said this, In one sense, Christ is the eternally begotten son. In another sense, he was begotten incarnation. In a third sense, he was begotten in resurrection, the firstborn from the dead. End of quote. Because Christ is truly God and truly man, Christ could not be created. Hence the doctrine of the preeminence of Christ, that he's always existed even before birth. Because Christ is truly man and truly God, it says in Colossians 1.18, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Everything he might be preeminent. Everything, and I mean everything, and everyone, Christ is preeminent. Christ is our object of worship, and he is the angel's object of worship. As another said, and I quote, He is higher in nature, higher in rank, higher in intellect, and higher in power than they. He is nothing less than very God of very God, the very man who suffered on Calvary, end of quote. The firstborn here is the Greek word protot prototokos, prototokos, uh, which means Christ is the firstborn. He is the eldest. He is preeminent. He is first in time and or that he is unmistakably, unmistakably sovereign over all of creation and all of matters. 
It also means or refers to the first among others whom follow him. And Christ is preeminent, supreme, and sovereign over all of the nonsense that we see going on in the world together today in the news. He is supreme and sovereign and sufficient over all current affairs and current events. The angels were created to worship God, and we humans were created in the image of God, in the image of Christ. We were created to worship God, and because Jesus is Lord, we are to worship him as Lord of all. And when we worship or idolize anything else or put anything else before God and Christ, we are sinning against the Lord our God. That it would be perhaps a violation of the first commandment and the second commandment. To have any gods before God or to have any idols to commit idolatry. Moving on next in verses 7 through 9 is Christ perfectly loves and perfectly hates. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of, un upright, excuse me, of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness before your companions. Verse 7 says, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Here he quotes from Psalm 104.4, as we said last week in the introduction, and we mentioned and we taught through verses 1 through 4, we will see much of the Septuagint in the book of Hebrews. And verse in Psalm 104.4 says that God makes his messengers, the angels, into winds and his servants into flames. God's angels are in a spirit form, hence like the wind. But they are also like a minister of fire. They can devour or flame forth the Lord's will. They can flame forth the will of God. The angels are subject to the headship and lordship of Christ, and they are to do his will, whether it be to give assistance to mankind or to perform his divine errands or to aid him in his judgments. They will do his will. Obviously, a third of the angels fell. They are actually doing the will of Satan, unfortunately, the demons. Next, in verse 8, he quotes from Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7. Verse 8, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You see, God placed Christ at his right hand, seated on his throne. Uh, this throne is the Greek word thronos. It is a noun masculine, which is a stately seat, which is a seat of power or a divine chair of state. And this chair of state comes with a footstool. And remember that everybody is under Christ and his enemies are under his footstool. Unearthly kings, princes, politicians, and all presidents God's throne is forever and ever, and they are under his lordship, whether they believe it or not. And one day, they will all have to answer to Christ, to God in Christ, and give, give an account for every sin they've ever committed. And of course, every sin that I've committed as a Christian, and you as a Christian, has been forgiven by Christ. Thanks be to God. His scepter, or rod, is upright. It is perfect in his administration and judgment. It is perfect in his judgment and in his administration. It says in Psalm 146, 3 through 7, Put not your trust in princes, and a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that very day his plans perish. Blessed is he whose hope is in the God of Jacob, that's the God of the Scriptures, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, 
who keeps faith forever, who executes judgment for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free. As one author said this, and I quote, Our God is no usurper and no oppressor. Even when he shall break his enemies with a rod of iron, he will do no wrong. His vengeance and his grace are both in conformity with justice. So we trust him without suspicion. He cannot err. No affliction is too severe, for he sends it. No judgment too harsh, for he ordains it. O oh, blessed hands of Jesus, the reigning power is safe with you. All the just rejoice in the government of the king who reigns in righteousness. End of quote. Verse 9. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness before your companions. In verse 9a, it says, God loved righteousness, but he hated unrighteousness. He hated lawlessness. He hated wickedness or sin. Uh, today, most of our evangelicalism I, don't, I say that word because I'm not speaking to the true church, but evangelicalism has a worldly form of love, an unbiblical love that tolerates, accepts, condones, celebrates, and even acquiesces to sin. But the God of the Bible and the Jesus of the Scriptures does not accept, condone, celebrate, nor acquiesce to sin. In fact, he hates sin, and those who practice sin iniquity, and or lawlessness. Christ does not hold a middle ground in attempt to foster an environment of unity or peace amongst sin, unbiblical views, and or bad doctrine. Nor does he extend a common grace between his church and the lost world. There's nothing common about God's grace. And since the scriptures tell us to be imitators of God, then we too must hate sin and love righteousness. As one scholar said this, his providence by which he rules from his throne of mediation when rightly understood reveals the same and his final judgment will proclaim it before all worlds. We should imitate him both in his love and hate they are both needful to complete a righteous character, end of quote. We don't hear that taught in many pulpits anymore, do we? But in verse 9b, he says this, Therefore God, your God, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Because Jesus, again, is truly God and truly man, and because Jesus is perfect, his walk was perfect and obedient to the Father, he was anointed with this oil of gladness or this oil of joy. And not just a little gladness. He was anointed with this oil of gladness. He is full of gladness. He is full of a superior joy and more so than anyone else. And his people will have a gladness and a joy in the Lord. His people are a thankful, glad, joyful people. His joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Historically speaking, during special dinners or banquets in the days of the, when these scriptures were being written, on parchments, etc., I'm talking about before they were written in the book today we know as a Bible, but distinguished guests were anointed with oil. So much oil that they literally and liberally actually poured it over the head. That's how much oil they had. The greatest man to ever live is Jesus. But he's more than a mere man. He is the man, Christ Jesus, God incarnate. And God the Father anointed his son Jesus with much of this oil. Remember that Jesus is the joy of the world. And he brought joy into this lost world. Which is another reason why we must obey the commandment and obligation to evangelize the lost and to offer them the joy of our salvation. 
I'm not talking about an unbiblical so-called friendship evangelism. 87% of all evangelism efforts in the book of Acts were out there preaching the gospel to the lost and sharing the gospel. Most of them preaching. But, but he didn't say to go out there and make friends with everybody, every, everyone first. Sharing or preaching his glorious gospel is a duty. It is a command. It is obligatory according to Romans chapter 1. It is an obligation of every Christian to do so. Uh, just last week, glory to God, one of the families in this church went on a special mission field in a far off land called Colorado to share the gospel with his family. And God was glorified. And God was pleased. And Christ was exalted. And this church was very much encouraged by that. Moving on, next in verses 10 through 12. Is our creator in Christ our eternal, but is creation not so? Verses 10 and 12. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens of the work are in your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. This Lord here in verse 10 is the Greek word kurios, uh, which is a noun masculine, uh, which means a supreme in authority, as a supreme controller. <coughs> Excuse me. A master. It means on the master, our God, the God that created everything by the work of his own hands. That is this Lord. But in verse 11, he warns us that all of his creation will perish. Although it all perishes, God and Christ remain eternally forever. Uh, and, and his church will remain with God and Christ. And that this entire lost world and the world system will all wear out like an old garment or like our dirty laundry. In verse 12, matter of fact, it says in Ecclesiastes, all of these things of this world under the sun are vanity, vanity. It's all vanity. It's all going to perish. It's like a flower that fades away. It's like a vapor that fades away. The Lord says, and in verse 12, he further describes the destruction of, or the perishing of his creation and the lost, like a robe that God rolls up like our laundry. Psalm 102, 25 through 28 says this, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens of the work are your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, you will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. It's often people in the world, they, they, they worship the false deity of me, myself, and I. Me, 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 I, I, I. The scriptures keep pointing at God, Christ, you, 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 you alone are worthy, God. You alone are worthy, God. God is holy, holy, holy. But this is not all bad news that the world's going to perish. It's not all bad news that this beautiful creation that he has given us will one day perish. It's not all doom and gloom because Christ's church will not perish. And because of Christ, his followers will live eternally with him forever. His followers will live with them. The bond slaves of Christ will live with him. Next is verses 13 through 14. God's angels are for his elect. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Verse 13 is a rhetorical question. To which angel did God say, sit at my right hand? The answer is none. That position is for Christ only to be seated at the right hand of the Father. 
To be seated at the right hand of God the Father represents the position of the highest honor and power, and only Christ can occupy that seat. Now, sometimes we think we call the whoever the president may be in the White House, it changes every four years or every eight years. It doesn't matter. It always changes. And we speak that per, of that person as the most powerful leader of the free world. But to be seated at the right hand of the Father represents the position of the highest honor, highest respect, highest sovereignty, highest power, highest everything, and only Christ can occupy that office. That's the seat that, and the office that matters the most to me. Though angels are higher than we are in regards to the order of salvation, or excuse me, in the order of creation, uh, but they are created for God's glory and to do his will while assisting us or aiding us in, uh, as our guardian angels, especially in the realm of spiritual warfare. Our guardian, our, our angels, they guard us. God sends them to watch over to us, to protect us. He can set up a legion of angels if you need it. And he also sends them to help us in the realm of spiritual warfare, according to Ephesians 6. It says in Psalms 8, 4 through 6, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. Did you hear that, church? All things are under his feet. What things are under his feet? All things are under his feet. Except for God's elect, every powerful leader, every president, every legislator, every politician, and every nation will be under Christ. And on Judgment Day, if, they didn't, if Christ does not know them as one of God's elect, he will cast them into the lake of fire, which will be their second death. What about you, church? Well, that's a, that was a bad question. The church. The true church is going to heaven. It's my, pray that every, it's my prayer that everybody in this congregation will know Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's my prayer that everybody that's sitting in this congregation today will be saved, will be a blood-bought, repented follower of Christ, so that you may experience the everlasting life and love of God and mercies and grace of God in heaven. Verse 14 says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Uh, though the angels play an amazing role, uh, but they are underneath the office of Christ, who is Lord of all. Even the angels are underneath the office of Christ. We have some very good neighbors, one block south of us. And uh, they attend a church in Redlands, wonderful Christian people, and him and his wife, asked me frequently to pray for their daughter who lives with them. She frequently talks about angels, and sometimes that's all she talks about is the angels. And she rarely talks about Christ. It is a grave sin to worship angels. And I pray for that girl. In fact, under the headship and lordship of Christ, his angels serve those whom receive salvation. Christ, and that, excuse me, that is the church. The Lord's angels assist us in opposing Satan and the demons and the schemes of the, and wiles of the devil. As Calvin said, but this benefit he grants especially to his chosen people. Hence the angels may minister to us. We must be the members of Christ. If you want the angels to minister to you, you must be members of Christ. How often do we see on social media non-Christians claim that an angel was watching over them? That's idolatry. If I have an angel that ever watched over me, which I believe has, I've been in through some pretty near-death situations, and I'm sure God's angels were at work, but shame on me to give the angel glory 
And shame on me for not giving God all the glory. And Christ all the glory. This word salvation is the Greek word soteria. It is used 40 times in the scriptures and seven times here in the book of Hebrews. And there's much exclusivity with this soteria as it applies only to God's elect. And it means to, to rescue, to bring to safety, either physically or morally. Christ saved me physically and spiritually and morally, as well as the rest of his church. It also means to deliver salvation, to save or to be saved. It also means deliverance from the molestation of enemies. In closing, church, let us apply these scriptures in our lives. Let us not just be mere believers. Let us live our lives by demonstrating these scriptures in faith and demonstrate that we are believers, that we have faith. That even when the world falls apart, the church does not, because the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And if anybody here is lacking faith and is having a difficult time trusting in the Lord, please ask him for strength in that area. Come to a brother or sister in this church and confess your sins to them and ask them that you want to be discipled in that area and that you want to be watched over because that's what we do. We love each other. We want to watch over each other. We're all at risk of doubting. We're all at risk not losing our faith in a salvation, salvific way, but we can lose some faith while we're still here on earth. And we don't want that to happen to us. Father, thank you for your scriptures. They are inerrant, sufficient, infallible. Thank you for Christ, who is seated at your right hand. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask that you administer to us through your means of grace, through the, through the, the supper that we're going to practice as we do this, these things in remembrance of Christ who died for this church. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Brother Robin's going to pass out the elements. If you are a repented, repenting, born again, bond slave to Christ, please have communion with us. And I'll read this passage as he passes out the elements. And therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and of the Lord. But let a man examine himself so that let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who drinks or eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world.